morning. <coughs> we're going on a journey, and uh, not everyone's here all the time, so we've got to pack a lot into one thing. So we're doing a subject that you may have forgotten about uh, for years and years, and um, it's good to be excited about it again. And um, for you to get this properly, you'll need to go home and listen to it a couple of times um, to get it really into your spirit. And so I think we've got a, a overhead that's just going to come up real quickly for a few seconds. <coughs> Jerusalem, the future capital of the world. And we want to talk about the city of Jerusalem this morning. Hallelujah. So Jerusalem is one of the oldest cities um, in the world. It is regarded as holy by three Abrahamic faiths. <coughs> Islam, they want that city. One day they, they, they want a two-state solution. They want um, Jerusalem to be their capital because they believe that, that a firstborn son gets the inheritance. And so Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn son. So they believe um, it's theirs. But what happened is God wanted Isaac, Abraham's son. But Abraham played up and had a baby to somebody else. And so that's why the, the Muslims are annoyed because the firstborn gets the inheritance. And the, the Jewish people... Abraham's their father. God set up a people and the city is theirs. But for us, Genesis 3.29 says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs to the promise. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the city of Jerusalem has been destroyed at least two times. Um, attacked 53 times, besieged 23 times, and recaptured about 44 times. Who has ever heard of such a thing? So Isaiah 68, um, eight, verse 8. We can open our Bibles to a few scriptures this morning, but um, for sake of time, I'll just have to quote a few. But Isaiah 68, verse 8 says, Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in a day, or shall Zion be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labour, she gave birth to her children. And in Amos Chapter 9, verses 14 to 15. The scripture says, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. And I will plant them in their land. And they shall no longer be pulled up. For I have given it to them, says the Lord. So when they come back to the land, they will never, ever... Um, be shifted um, from there again. And the Bible talks in um, Luke chapter 21, what happened is Jerusalem was destroyed. The disciples said to Jesus, look at this beautiful temple, and he said it will be destroyed. And uh, when they're talking about it being destroyed, it says that when you see the armies surround Jerusalem run into the hills, and then it says Jerusalem will be trampled on till the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Well, the time of the Gentiles must be fulfilled now. The Bible says in Romans that when the full number of Gentiles come in, all Israel will be saved. So we're getting close. So who can believe such a thing? That in one day, May 14, 1948, Israel become a nation. The Bible says that it will never be uprooted again. And he said Jerusalem will be trampled on until the time of the Gentiles. What a miracle. In 2006, <clears throat> some 1900 years later, wow, Israel become the largest place of the Jewish people. 
actually outclassed the United States. When they come back in 1948, there were some 650,000 of them. Then it grew to five-something million. And then by 220, they said it'd be over six. And you know, so what is it now? So the significance of the... But God said, can a nation be born in a day? And in May 1948, it was. And he said that they would come back to their land. And that's exactly what they're doing. It's called Aliyah. Aliyah means to go up. For an example, to go up to the second story of your house. But in scripture, it's used to go up. In Exodus 19.20, it says, The Lord shall come down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to go to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. Aliyah, he went up. <coughs> so it became known as that you would go up to worship. You would go up to Jerusalem. And after the dispersion, when they were captured and taken away to Babylon, everybody looked forward again one day to be able to go up to Jerusalem. And that's why the Jews always used to, 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 when they were celebrating or when they were having feast days, they used to say, next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem. Aliyah, they want to go up <coughs> to Jerusalem. And in the 19... In the 1800s, organised groups begin to go back to Israel because they wanted to, to plant and uh, make a living and uh, build everything um, up again. And so Aliyah become the official term for the migration of the Jews back to Israel. And in 1950, the Jewish government, they called it a law of return. And so who can make Aliyah? Well, you can be a Jewish, you can be, have different colour, you can be male, you can be female, you can be poor, you can be rich. Whatever it is that you can make Aliyah, you can return back home. So how does one make Aliyah? Well, you fill in a form and then you assign um, an Aliyah supervisor and you fill out the form and eventually you get an Aliyah visa. And then you can book your plane ticket and you can return home. Whoever has heard of such a thing? Isn't that exciting? People don't want to believe in God, but how could that happen? Who has heard of such a thing? God said it and it took place. What we want to do now is we want to settle the confusion who owns the city of Jerusalem? Everybody wants it. People say the Jews shouldn't have it. But who owns the city? I think Psalm 132, 13 to 14 is going to come up on the screen. For the Lord has chosen Zion. Let's come up here. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. God is not confused on who owns the city of Jerusalem. He knows who owns it. And then in Ezekiel 5, you see a lot of men, they they try to work out with all their modern instruments, you know, where the centre of the world is. But Ezekiel 5.5 5 says, Thus says the Lord, this is Jerusalem. I've set her in the midst of the nations and all the countries are around her. It's God's city. It's in the centre of the world. He owns it and that's it. And when he wants it back, he gets it back. Hallelujah. Because he is God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Isn't that exciting? And in Zechariah, um, uh, when the armies, you know, um, are all surrounded Jerusalem and um, at the Battle of Armageddon and his feet touch the Mount of Olives. And uh, Zechariah 14.9 says, And the Lord will be king over all the earth that day. The Lord will be one and his name is holy. Hallelujah. There, it's, there's no wriggle room here. It's settled forever. 
God owns the city. Hallelujah. It's his city. Amen. There's no regal room. Now, the making of the city of the Lord. Jerusalem is not mentioned in the first uh, five books of the Bible, but um, it appears first in Joshua 10. <coughs> New King James Version says, Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho on that day. God performed an amazing miracle. The sun and the moon stood still until Israel totally defeated her enemies. The one true Lord of righteousness prevailed. Now, I read Jerusalem, but it was Jerusalem then. We call it Jerusalem in English, so it was Jerusalem. And even though that Joshua conquered about 30 cities, they didn't actually you know, stay there and live there. <coughs> But in the 14th century, it was called Jerusalem. And um, that's backed up by the Amarna letters. that They were found in 1887 at Amarna in a site in, in Egypt. They're in Germany now in, in a museum. And um, the letter comes actually addressed from Jerusalem. And the king of Jerusalem wanted... Um, it was Anakartan, which was the pharaoh of Egypt, and he wanted him to send reinforcements and soldiers uh, to help him attack his enemies. So it's very clear in the 14th century BC, it is Jerusalem. And when David comes along, about you know, a few hundred years later, it isn't actually Jerusalem anymore. But when he takes over the city, they call it Zion. And um, they call it the city of David, the city of God. And from then on, it's known as Jerusalem again. And so in uh, 1 Chronicles 11, there it says, the city of David. And David and, I think it starts from verse 3, the city of David. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Zebus, where Jebusites were inhabitants of the land. But the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, you shall not come here. Nevertheless, he took the, the Zion uh, that is the city of David. Hallelujah. And then later on you see Zion, it's the city of David, it's Jerusalem. And then Solomon began to build the house in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord appeared to David. That's 2 Chronicles 3, 1. And so we have Jerusalem, Jerusalem in the 14th century. Then the Jebusites come and change it to Zebus. When David took over again, God says it's my city, you're going to have it forever. And so they change it back to Jerusalem. So previous history, we won't read the verse out, but in Genesis um, 22 verse 2, um, we're told to now take your son, Abraham's told to take his son Isaac to the land of Moriah. And he's going to sacrifice him there. And um, he didn't, as you know. And in verse 14, And Abraham called, The Lord will, the name of this place will be, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And so he named it Yira, The Lord will provide. And so because God provided, God is Jehovah, so it's Jehovah Jireh, but he called it Yira. Now, previously before that, we have in Genesis 14, verse 18, um, it talks about <coughs> the king of Salem brought about bread and wine. He was the high priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said to Abraham, of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and, and blessed be God Most High, who, uh, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. And so it, there it's called Salem. <coughs> And Salem means peace. And if you do any study anywhere you like, any commentaries, it says that pretty well all commentators and Jewish commentators affirm that Salem is Jerusalem. Psalm 76 2 says, And his abode is in Salem, and his dwelling place is in Jerusalem. <coughs> and so it's called, Abraham calls it Yira, Melchizedek calls it Salem. So how did, did Jerusalem become Jerusalem become Jerusalem? 
Well, we don't know. But in the Jewish writings, they have this beautiful picture, whether it's true or not, but the fact is, Yir and Shalem got together, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The Midrash shares this beautiful process. The Holy One said, if I call the place Yira, as Abraham did, then the righteous Shem will complain. However, if I call it Shalem, the righteous Abraham will complain. Rather, I will call it Jerusalem. That is the name that will contain the way both of them called it Jerusalem. And so we have Jerusalem, whether that's how it actually happened or not. But it was first called Yira, then it was called Shalem, and it's Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So let's just recap this a little bit. So Melchizedek, who is a high priest, is in Jerusalem. Abraham goes to offer his son, it's in Jerusalem. They build the temple, it's in Jerusalem. Jesus died in Jerusalem, hallelujah. He went up to heaven from Jerusalem. He's coming back to Jerusalem from the same place. There's going to be a thousand year reign of peace with the devil locked up. It's going to be from Jerusalem, hallelujah. And then after that, there's going to be a renovation of the earth and there's going to be a new Jerusalem, hallelujah. And to him that are overcomers, the Bible says that we will, we will get to eat of the tree of life which is in Jerusalem, praise God. Isn't that exciting? Jerusalem is a part of your inheritance. Isn't that amazing? And that's why as Christians we love Jerusalem because God said, this is my city forever and we are a part of his kingdom and it's going to be our eternal city too as a part of your reward. Maybe, just maybe, <coughs> we can go back a little further. What I've said so far is absolutely biblical, um, but if you look at God's patterns and God's ways and look at some things, maybe we could just go back a little bit further. For instance, where's Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai is on is Jebel Musa on the Sinai Peninsula down, down from Egypt. But you look around, you can't see much evidence that they were ever there. <coughs> Others have done um, expeditions in more recent years, and there's getting more and more and more of them. And uh, they just go down out of Egypt to, to Land's End, where, it's, where it says, down to Mount Suf, and there they see this land bridge 50 foot underwater. Um, they go across there, they go in a bit, and... Um, the Arabs say, um, this is the mountain of Moses. This is Jabal our laws. This is where Moses come. And, um, you know, the mountain, it's all black on top. You can see the split rock there. Um, but people will still argue, no, it's still the other way. I mean, that's the same with everything. No matter what doctrine I believe, someone sitting here with something different. But, that, but that's how it always is. But where's the Garden of Eden? I mean, Mount Sinai is supposed to be there, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's in Arabia, like the Bible says in Galatians. Mount Sinai is in Arabia. So where's the Garden of Eden? Well, a lot of people say, or most people say, well, because of... The, because of um, some of the rivers are gone now and you've had the flood, so nobody really knows, but because the Tigris and Euphrates are going up there, they say, oh, it's in Iraq. But is it in Iraq? If they're wrong about Sinai, why can't they be wrong about, about where the Garden of Eden is? But there's a lot of um, Jewish Messianic Jews today and different people doing research and they would say they think the Garden of Eden was in Jerusalem. And that makes a couple of interesting thoughts just for us to look at this morning. In Genesis 2, it says, The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. And um, he put man in there, and the tree of life was in the, in the midst of the garden. Most translations in the east or eastward. 
But is east or eastward, is it a direction or is it a location? Just real quickly in Genesis 29, 1. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And we know Abraham originally went up from Ur to Aaron, Haran and then they came down, you know, around there, Mount Moriah and, um, and uh, the, the land of Canaan. So the Bible's calling that the land of the east. Then Judges 6, it says, So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up also Amicalites and the people of the east. And so if around Moriah, Jerusalem area is the east, down a little bit further because the garden would have been fairly big, um, that's called the people of the east where the Amicalites and that are. Now isn't it interesting that... Um, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, um, in Bethlehem um, wise men came from the east. It was a fairly, fairly big area, come from the east. And they followed a star that stood over the east. That was Bethlehem, just a few miles from Jerusalem. So is it possible that the Garden of Eden was actually... Jerusalem. Here's why I personally think it is. Where was the tree of life? It was in the Garden of Eden. Where is the tree of life? Revelation 2, 7 says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him to eat of the bread of the life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Paradise means park, means garden. Everything started in the garden, everything's going to finish in the garden. Where, where is the tree of life? It's in Jerusalem. When, when the new city comes down, it talks about the tree of life there in the midst of a garden. It's in Jerusalem. If it was in Jerusalem then, it probably was in the Jerusalem before. When you look at God's patterns, why would he shift it? He has one door into the tabernacle, one door into the temple. There's only one way to God. Jesus says, I am the door. He starts off with sevens, isn't it? Six is the number of man, 666. And he starts off with seven. Made the world six days, seventh he rested. Um, everywhere you go, there's just sevens in the Bible. Seven, seven angels, seven churches, seven years weak at Daniel. He doesn't seem to change his patterns. <clears throat> and so therefore when it comes to Christ coming to earth and um, dying and everything, when he died, when he rose and when the church was born, it all happens on feast days. He has patterns, he doesn't seem to change. And so if all his comings were, were on feast days, the first coming, then they're probably going to be that way on the second coming. I can't imagine him transplanting the tree from Iraq to Jerusalem. If the tree's in Jerusalem, I think it was always in Jerusalem. I think they probably got it wrong. And if we could squeeze that in there as a little bit of extra history... I mean, that would make it very exciting because that would mean <coughs> then that when Cain and Abel came to give a sacrifice, when one had a, a grain offering but the other one had a, 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 an animal offering a sin offering, the first sacrifice of sin would have been in that Jerusalem area. And then when Abraham met Keldizedek, it would be in Jerusalem. And then when Abraham offered his son, that would be in Jerusalem. And when they built the temple, that would be in Jerusalem. And when Jesus was born, it was in Bethlehem, just a few miles from Jerusalem. And when Jesus died, he died in Jerusalem. And so if you look at it like that, he offered a sacrifice for, his, for, for sin, to fix a sin problem in Jerusalem, exactly the same place where the sin problem started from. And then he was taken up to heaven from Jerusalem. And then he's coming back from Jerusalem. His feet touch the Mount of Olive in Jerusalem and it splits in half. And he rules from Jerusalem, hallelujah. And when he makes a new heaven and new earth and a new city, it's in Jerusalem, hallelujah. And that's where you're going to live. And if you're an overcomer, you're going to get to eat from the tree of life which is in Jerusalem, which is in the garden, praise God. 
And when you put all that together, to me, that's pretty exciting. Hallelujah. So just getting um, ready to close up. There's something real exciting. <clears throat> he wants his city back. That's what he wants. He wants his city back. <clears throat> he is declared in the, descript- in the scriptures that it's his city. You and I know that as Christians. And we know he's going to rule from there. But the world doesn't know it's his city. And um, he wants it back. Now, there's something called a jubilee year, um, which every 50 years land and everything went back to the original owners. But, of course, after the dispersion, you know, that doesn't happen. But they still know where, when their jubilee year is. <coughs> now, 1917 is a jubilee year. General Allenby comes in and liberates Jerusalem. The Turks are gone. It's now in the hands of the British, which eventually they handed over in 1948 and they get their land back. That's the start of him wanting Jerusalem back. He did it on a jubilee year. Now, the next jubilee year, believe it or not, is 1967. He says, I want my city back. And he's going to get it back. And he got it back in six days. And uh, it doesn't say they had a hook in their jaw like it does in Ezekiel, uh, that they're gonna, God's going to put a hook and drag them down. It doesn't say that, but somehow all the Egyptians and the Arab armies, they decided that they were, they were going to destroy the Jews. And God said, I'm having my city back, thank you very much. <coughs> and one morning at 7.30, 183 fighter jets hit the skies, they, <coughs> they went really low under the radar and then they turned and they went out to sea and they headed towards Egypt and um, the pilots say they were, you know, just 50, 60 feet above the water. It was so scary. And what happened in Egypt, uh, most of the leaders of Egypt, <coughs> um, they, they, they were um, up in a plane um, doing some experiments and having a conference up there and uh, they had given orders... <coughs> that no planes were to be shot down if anything's in the sky to be shot down while they're there. Man, God said he wanted his city back. He had this set up real good. And all of a sudden, the fighters just come up in the air and down they came. And uh, by the time they had finished, they they had destroyed 11 airports and by the time the six days were over, uh, 400-odd Arab planes were destroyed and they only lost 46 or something. But what a miracle. People saw angels in the sky. But God said, I want my city back. And um, he got it back. But now here's the weirdest thing of all. The next Jubilee year, he decides that he has his city back. He knows it's his city. You know it's his city. You've got the word. You know you're going to rule from that city. But the rest of the world doesn't know it's his city. And he's about to announce to the world that it's his city. And he has a man in place all ready to do it. And um, that man, of course, is Donald J. Trump. Donald John Trump. Now, what on earth does Donald J. Trump mean? Well, there's thousands of people called Donald. Thousands of people called John. That's my middle name. Lots of surnames called Trump. But Donald means world ruler. John means graced by God. And a Trump is a Trump. A trumpet makes a sound. <clears throat> so now you start putting it together. Donald J. Trump, ruler of the free world, graced by God. Uh, uh, how can he be graced by God? He's a womanizer. He's polarizing. Um, he makes m- many, many mistakes. He's probably dodged um, lots of attacks. I mean, um, how can he be graced by God? But I must remind you that that's not the first time that God has used a Gentile leader to bless Israel. <coughs> and um, I think we might even have that one coming up on the screen, Ezra 1, 1 to 2. 
Now in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus. So something just stirred up in him, this Gentile man, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth of the Lord God of heaven has given to me and he has commanded me to build a house for him which is in um, Judah. (coughs) And of course, um, the amazing thing about that is that was prophesied 150 years before his time. In Isaiah 44, 28, it says, Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Isaiah 45, 1, Thus says the Lord is anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him. And so he actually assisted the Jews to go back to the land. He didn't complete the job, Darius and, and others did, but, but God chose him to declare um, you know, that Jerusalem was important to be built. So now we go back to Donald J. Trump. Donald John Trump, ru- ruler of the free world, graced by God, as a trumpet makes a sound and declares to the whole world that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And I heard him on interviews actually go further and say that it is the eternal city of God and always will be. Wow. Wow. But wait, there's more. May 14, 1948, Israel becomes a nation. May 14, 2018, not a jubilee year this time, but 70 years. You know, 70 weeks, seven is God's number. Seven is a number of completion. (coughs) And so 70 years later, he not only has Donald J. Trump ruler of the free world, graced by God, announced to the world that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, he even backs that up by his power on his nation and he actually takes their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? God wants his city back. He says it's his and he decided it was going to be announced to the, to the world and he used a man called Donald J. Trump and you probably just shake your head. But God will do what he wants to do and when he wants his city back or when he wants the people to come back, it will happen. People can jump, people can shout, people can do what they like. If God said it, you'll do it. Amen? Isn't that awesome? <clears throat> but just after that, Donald Trump, in closing, disappears. He's not a leader anymore. Well, maybe that was the only purpose that God had for him. To announce to the world that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. <clears throat> but doesn't Genesis 12, 3, speaking about Israel, God's people say, I will bless those who bless you. So was Donald Trump ever honoured and ever blessed for standing up for Israel? Doesn't look like it. He's in court all the time now. He's been trashed and harpooned and people hate him. And so I thought the scripture says, I will bless those who bless you. Well, you know, God did bless him and God's people, the Jewish people, blessed him. So if we could bring up the the next slide. You see, the Jewish people believe they're going to rebuild their temple. And um, they've already started. They're building bricks and all that sort of thing. Um, making lots of clothing and lots of temple articles, it's not coming up. But anyway, <coughs> they decided in this temple they're going to have, a, have to have a temple coin. And so they've made this temple coin uh, for temple tax. And on one side of it, they have their temple. And on the other side of it, they have the two men 
that stood up to the world and declared Israel to be the capital. And on the second side of the temple coin is a picture of King Cyrus with Donald J. Trump beside him. Hallelujah. I wanted to show you that, but it hasn't, um, hasn't come up. But praise God. And so we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There it is. You see the Sanhedrin and the temple people, um, they made it, and there it is. I will bless those who bless you. Most of the world hate him, but God allowed the Jewish people to honour him on a temple coin that is to be used in the new temple. That's pretty amazing. Hallelujah. Isn't, isn't God awesome? I mean, he does... Sometimes you think nothing's happening, but when God wants to do something, um, he will do it. <clears throat> so we need to finish, but just in um, closing there, Dion might like to come up and play keys. <clears throat> but oh, praise God, eh? That's, that's there, that's it. The future capital of the world. See, my... my I live in Warwickville, Port Thomas Street. I used to live in Portland. Um, I don't know where you live, but or where you've always lived. But I have a future address. <laughs> and it is 7 Paradise Road, Jerusalem, postcode 7777. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> isn't that exciting? <clears throat> and if you look at it like that, the Garden of Eden was most likely where the city of Jerusalem was built. And the first sacrifice for sin would have been at that Jerusalem site. And when Abraham met Melchizedek, it would have been at the Jerusalem site. When Abraham took his son, that was Jerusalem. When they built the temple, they built it at Jerusalem. When Jesus was born, it was just out of Jerusalem. When he died, it was in Jerusalem. His sacrifice for sin, once and for all, was most likely in the place where sin started. And he went to heaven from Jerusalem. He's coming back to Jerusalem. His feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives and it's going to split in half. And he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And then in the new heaven and new earth, it says, To him who overcomes, I will give him to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God, in the garden. Hallelujah. The question is, though, are you an overcomer? Are you an overcomer? Have you overcome? You know, a lot of people put up their hand in an altar call and they think they're saved. <clears throat> but I think that that's one of the biggest lies that preachers ever say. Just come to Jesus, give Jesus a try. Just put up your hand, you know, and oh, praise God, you know, 10 people got saved today. I got no idea whether you got saved or whether you didn't. Because the Bible says about the parable of the sower, many believe for a little while and go on, and then the devil comes along and snatches the word out of their mouth so that they don't get saved. That's got nothing to do with it, anything. That's just your first response. You may have been emotional. You may be going through some things. You made a response. But it's, are you an overcomer? Are you there at the end? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of the Father. Matthew 3, 8 says to go and bear fruit in accordance with repentance. Matthew 7, 20 says, by their fruits, you shall know them. Can people see that you're different? Or you think that you're going to heaven because you put a hand up? Now, I believe that people in this room, you know, you've made a decision. But you know, maybe there's somebody that, you know, maybe I'm on the wrong track. But there's a lot of people online that wouldn't be here all the time. I've got no idea where they come from. But when you look at the state of the church and the liberalism in the church and the way a lot of God's people in the church live, 
then you've got to ask the question, are they bearing fruit in accordance with repentance or are they living their own lives? And you've probably heard me say this before, but it's a, it's a good shock every now and again um, just to think, you know, is he my saviour or is he my saviour and Lord? Do you attempt every day by the power of the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, not your own strength, to walk in his ways? When your head hits the pillar tonight and you don't wake up in the morning, where are you going to be? Where are you going to be? I mean, you don't have to strive in the flesh. It's just, it's just very simple. You just say, Lord, I thank you for today. I've been walking with you today. By grace, not in my strength. Have I failed you anywhere today? Oh, I think I got a bit angry before. I'm sorry, Lord, for that. Um, yeah, just please forgive me, Lord. Um, Lord, tomorrow, by your grace, you know, can you remind me? Can your spirit just speak to me if I'm doing something I shouldn't be? Because that's what it is. It's by their fruit ye shall know them. Jesus says, if you love me, you obey me. Why do you call me Lord if you don't do the things that I ask? And so it's a really good question for those online, everyone in the room, even myself. You know, <clears throat> I think the way some Christians live, it's like when they get up, they start on the internet, they stay on the internet, they finish on the internet. But what we need to do is start with the Word, stay in the Word, and finish in the Word. And this Bible is the only rule and standard that you have for your life. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to pray a prayer, and if anything that's gelled in that... Um, you know, pretty well Christians here, but for those online, there may be some of you who aren't Christians. But <clears throat> when I finish my prayer, um, you know, often we say, you know, heads bowed, eyes closed, don't want to embarrass anybody. Gee, that sounds nice and sweet. But Jesus says, if you deny me, I'll deny you. Somewhere along the line, you can't be a secret Christian. And so, you know, online, if you um, give your heart to Jesus for the first time this morning, please go and tell someone. And um, if you say that prayer, I'm not going to tell you um, that you're going to heaven because you might show up to church again. You might walk away, never go near a church again and believe you're going to heaven because some preacher told you. But what I'm going to tell you is if you've made that decision in your heart, then you need to keep walking. You need to be an overcomer. You need to be there at the end. You need to be being changed from glory to glory. Yes, you're not perfect. Yes, you're working things out. Yes, you're struggling and going on, but it's not striving because, it, because you're asking by His grace to help you. And you, you allow Him to change you. But the thing is, you've decided in your heart that you're going to, well, I don't know whether you say attempt or do, but... Walk in his ways. Whatever he says, that's what you want to do. I know lots of Christians that say, I know that's what God wants me to do, but I don't want to do it. But that's not really good. <laughs> if you love me, you obey me. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, we just pray for anybody who's listening to the sound of my voice or, or might even be listening um, <clears throat> to our program in a week's time or two weeks' time. Um, they just come across it on the internet that, that you can just say that you're tired of your life, you're tired of sin, that it is destroying you. You believe in your heart that Jesus is real, but you need to make a decision. You can ask him to forgive you of your sin. You can make a declaration that you not only want a saviour, but you want a Lord. Your ways have been no good. And so now I want to walk your ways. And he can help you. And you need to find a church. You need to get a Bible. Even though it might be hard to understand, you keep going. You dig in, you dig in, you dig in. 
You start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, you finish in the Bible, you find some, some men or some other women that can help you and um, encourage you and you keep going and you're there at the end. And you see, and sometimes the way people live, it's not in accordance with repentance. You know, like ministers fall. Some ministers have murdered their wives and nearly got away with it, but got caught. And, you know, oh, gee, big mega church. Oh, isn't that good? But, you know, it's, it's by their fruits, ye shall know them. And if you've asked Jesus into your life today, then please don't just do it as an emotional thing with people online. It's a, it's a real thing. If, a lot of people want help, but when the problem's fixed, they don't want to help anymore that's the end of it but he has to be lord for the rest of your life in jesus name amen hallelujah amen god is good hallelujah where's your future address seven paradise road jerusalem postcode double seven double seven god bless you all i know it was probably a little bit long but we couldn't do that in two sessions i don't think because people are not always there but you can go and listen and listen and listen two or three times till you get it amen god bless you you got something to say pastor lisa coffee time yeah pastor lisa says coffee will be served (laughs) so god bless you all have a great day have some fellowship amen god is good